All right, let's pray. Uh, Father God, thanks so much for the opportunity to sit um, to here together, but also to sit under your word. And we thank you for those who have uh, preached to us this morning from your word in our congregations. Uh, we thank you that we uh, were able to hear of the amazing love that you have for us and have shown for us through your son Jesus, through his suffering uh, and death on the cross. Uh, and Lord, we, as we look at the material we look at today, we see how desperately we need that um, salvation from you, for you, and from you, from your wrath. We pray, Lord, that uh, you'll make that clear to us as we look at your word today and uh, in, be encouraged to continue to trust in your son. Amen. All righty. Um, let me ask, how are you all going with the course so far? Are you learning new things? Is there anything that stands out that you've gone, wow, I've never picked up on that before, or this has changed something for me? Why, like, the human state, mm -hmm. and just what happened before they were getting done. Mm. It's always been, oh, well, you know, something they switched to, they had a very quick time, and with all these things, they already got on thing, and mm. they all got carried off to the other, and you just kind of pick it up and then you're not going yeah, yeah, the later prophets. Yeah. They're all in exile. Mm. So. Yeah. Yeah, it certainly starts to piece things together so that you can go, oh, I, I knew that, but I didn't see how that one thing connects to the other. I think in this section too, this is one of those sections where you really do need to do what we talked about at the beginning, which is we, we might ask, we might go, well, they, they you know, Israel went into exile because of their sin, sure. Um, but we need to look a little bit deeper at what's going on uh, in people's lives and people's hearts and see the connections which that has to ourselves as well. Um, you know, just like that illustration that I heard of the why did the Twin Towers fall down? You go, well, grab it. <laughs> um, but it's, it's actually a much more complex story behind it. Uh, this is, we're going to sweep over it, but it is a complex story, um, even though there's a general outcome or general reason for the decline of Israel. Yeah. All right, let's um, have a look at the, the big picture um, of what we're dealing with. This is straight out of the book that uh, you've got. So um, we've got the, uh, I guess, parallel histories of these two kingdoms. And um, uh, that's one of the confusing things as you read this, uh, this section is the back and forth nature of it. Um, and if you, if you blink sometimes as you're reading through uh, one and two kings, you, you forget where, sorry, where am I? Am I in Judah or, or am I in Israel? And um, which one was which, especially when some of their names sound so similar. Yeah, mm -hmm. yeah, yeah. Um, so that's a that's and that's a pretty common diagram. In fact, that diagram is not original to this book. It's out of um, God. It's out of Gospel and Kingdom by Graham Goldsworthy, uh, which is a bit of a, a classic now for biblical theology. Well recommended to have on your shelf and have a read through Gospel and Kingdom by Graham Goldsworthy. And um, it's a um, uh, it's you know, one of the I guess the book that's probably had the most influence in helping people get their heads around how the Old Testament fits with the New Testament. Um, and so you can see we're at the beginning, yeah, from Abraham obviously condensed there to David, um, and uh, and the relative time frames in which these. Uh, kingdoms fall out of, um, the, well, when the northern kingdom effectively falls out of the picture and when the southern kingdom goes into exile uh, and comes back uh, right through Jesus. 
So that's a handy one to, to keep hold of in your mind as well. One question I was thinking. So the Nordic Kingdom just disappeared. They all just disappeared. You don't hear of them coming back. Not quite. Um, you don't hear of them uh, as the Northern Kingdom anymore, but you do know um, even in, um, certainly not as a national or tribal identity, um, but there were people. Uh, so we'll, we'll get to that later, actually. There's a little bit of a hint of that um, in what um, the Lord says to Elisha, or Elisha. Um, well, Dave will probably cover that next week as well. All right, so we're we're beginning um, at the point of this division in the kingdom of of north and south. So we're going to read uh, one Kings eleven twenty nine to thirty nine to get an idea of why and what was happening. So someone want to read. 1 Kings 11, 29, to verse 39. About the time Jeroboam uh, was going out of Jerusalem, and Elijah, um, Elijah the prophet of Shiloh, went into the way, wearing the cloak. Now, the two of them were alone out in the country, and Elijah took hold of the new cloak he was wearing and tore it into gold pieces. He said to Jeroboam, take ten pieces for yourself, for this is what the Lord the God of Israel says. See, I'm going to tear the kingdom down of Solomon's hand and give you ten tribes. But for the sake of my servant David and the city of Jerusalem, which I have chosen out of all the tribes of Israel, we will have one tribe. I will do this because they have forsaken me and worship Ashtoreth, the goddess of the Sidonians. She watched the God of the Moabites and Molech the God of the Ammonites and have not walked in obedience to me. Lord, I'm not Israelite and my eyes. Nor kept my decrees and laws as David, Solomon's father, did. But I will not take the whole kingdom out of Solomon's hand. I have made him rule of all the days of his life for the sake of David, my servant, who have chosen to obey my commands and decrees. I will take the kingdom from his son's hands and give you ten tribes. I will give one tribe to his son so that David, my servant, will always have a land before me in Jerusalem, the city that I chose to put my name. However, as for you, I will take you and you will rule over all that your heart desires. You will be king over Israel. If you do whatever I command you, walk in obedience to me and do what is right in my eyes by obeying my decrees and commands as David my servant did, I will be with you. I will build your dynasty as enduring as the one I built for David and the future is rather for you. I will humble David's descendants because of this, but not forever. All right. Thanks, Andrew. Now, uh, what can you see um, were, I guess, well, I'll put some of it on the board there on the screen. Can you see the the reasons why uh, what was going on, why, why the Northern Kingdom even came about, why this split came about? Can you see that point in the text? To that disobedience. Yeah. Solomon's disobedience. Yeah. Yep. Yeah. And so with that disobedience comes the comes God's judgment. It's a judgment on his unfaithfulness, isn't it? Uh, which was the expectations of the king, on the king. Um, but the judgment doesn't end the whole uh, scenario. David's covenant remains. He's God's not going to abandon his promise to his people uh, or to his servant David. Uh, and Jeroboam gets. A pretty significant promise uh, that it will be just like David's kingdom, but with a limitation. There is this kind of this expectation that these kingdoms will, at one at some point in the future, come back together. It's the the Davidic covenant that's going to remain and take precedence. Um, it will not be forever. This judgment. 
because there's a sunset clause in there. But let's see how uh, Jeroboam fared. Uh, how do you think you'd go when you're given such an opportunity? Do you think you'll just trust God to deliver, or do you think you need to take things by the horns, so to speak? Horns being um, a rather ominous word in that. Uh, who wants to read 1 Kings 12, 25 to 33? Okay. Yeah. Golden calves Bethlehem and Dan. When Jeroboam fortified Bethlehem in the hill country of Bethlehem, and Lee lived up there, from there he went out and built up Peniel. Jeroboam thought to himself, The kingdom will now likely revert to the house of David. If these people go up to offer sacrifices at the temple of the Lord in Jerusalem, they will again give their allegiance to the Lord, to their Lord, Rehoboam, King of Judah. They will kill me and return to King Rehoboam. After seeing the advice, the king made two golden calves. He said to the people, It is too much for you to go up to Jerusalem. Here are your gods, Israel, who brought you up out of Egypt. One he set up in Bethel, and the other in Dan. And this thing became a sin. The people came to worship the one in Bethel and went as far as Dan to worship the other. Right. Yeah, just the shrines on high places before the priests of all sorts of people, even though they were not. He instituted a festival on the 15th day in the eighth month, like the festival held in Judah, and offered sacrifices on the altar. This he did in Bethel, sacrificing to the calves he had made. And at Bethel, he also installed priests at the high places he had made. On the 15th day of the eighth month, among his own choosing, he offered sacrifices on the altar he had built at Bethel. So he instituted the festival for the Israelites and went up to the altar to make offerings. All right. Thanks, Jackie, for reading that. So he's Jeroboam, you don't just fall into these roles. He's got a little bit of talent, uh, political nous, political talent. So one of the first things he does is fortify those cities. Um, so he's, he's doing what he thinks needs to be done to actually protect this kingdom um, and make sure that, you know, it's a stable kingdom, that there's a, um, uh, you know, a, a strong political order. Uh, but he's not so much the able leader uh, under God. Uh, that's probably what takes up, obviously, what takes up the most attention of the narrator of, uh, of, um, of kings. So Dan and Bethel, um, you can see Judah down the bottom there. It's a southern kingdom and the northern kingdom there in the purple. Uh, and you can see why he chose Dan and Bethel um, as the places for worship. Uh, and he spells it out in that passage. It's too much for the people to go to Jerusalem to worship. Uh, let's uh, set up a place where you can worship within our kingdom. I'll put one at either end so that uh, you'll only need to go as far south as Bethel or if it's closer, you can go up to Dan. Now, I don't know if you remember from Judges, Dan has already got um, a, a few things going on there in terms of uh, some worship practices. Uh, and had that going on even while it was happening in in Shiloh um, in uh, in the early days uh, during the judges. So they've, they've got something established there already, um, and uh, and it's also there to establish his own, I guess, their own identity as a um, as a as a people. Um, they'll be. They won't be losing their, he won't be losing their influence and they won't be losing their identity by being influenced by the uh, by Judah or, or the, the, the cultic practices at Jerusalem. That's um, another one, one of that. But you'll find throughout the rest of um, one or two kings, this becomes, well, the rest of the narration of the Northern Kingdom, this becomes the, the event that is constantly harking back to. Um, 
Did anything sound familiar in that reading as well about from elsewhere in the scriptures? Um, they go the mm. Yeah. 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 I'm kind of why he picked golden calves considering what happened. Mm. Yes. Mm. Yeah, why did he pick golden calves? Mm -hmm. I'm not really sure myself either. <laughs> um, in case you, if you're waiting for an answer, I mean, I suspect golden calves have a familiarity to the fertility cults uh, of the day. Um, and that's probably a reason behind why Aaron chose a golden calf. Um, although, according to Aaron, he didn't choose it, he just jumped out of the fire. Um, but. Uh, I love that. That's one of the best excuses in the Bible, isn't it? I threw in this gold and out came this calf. Um, yeah, okay. This, I came up with better excuses when I was a kid for yeah. how something got broken. Um, he institutes a new order of priests and not Levites. Um, the he just decides he'll he'll set up his own game. Um, institutes a new feast, uh, not one of the feasts that were given by God uh, in, uh, in Deuteronomy or Leviticus, uh, and the rest uh, of the particularly chapters 13 and 14 um, spell out the judgment, um, particularly on him, but it's the judgment that begins with him. It, it, it continues on uh, through, the, um, through the rest of it. Um, and uh, let me, if we read a little bit of those... Um, someone want to read 1 Kings 13, 3 to 6? Yeah. Yeah. He gave a sign saying that this is the sign which the Lord has ordained. This altar will be split asunder and the ashes on it will be scattered. When King Jeroboam heard of the sentence which the man of God pronounced against the Lord, he pointed to Bobby to inquire of Caesar. Immediately they found that he pointed at him and paralyzed, so that he could not call it back. The altar too was split asunder, and the ashes were scattered, and he filled it with a sign that the man of God had given in his command. The king appealed to the man of God to take the Lord as God had prayed for him, that his hand might be restored. The man of God did as he asked, the king's hand was restored, and he came as he had been before. Thanks, John. So uh, this, this is a man of God that uh, is sent to Jeroboam from Judah, um, probably um, not, uh, you know, a little bit suspicious. How come this southern is coming up telling us what to do? But uh, it, it's God's message. Uh, and there's so there's an immediate judgment. It's not as though Jeroboam can say, oh, I didn't know. Um, well, he did know, and he was he was given clear words, uh, and yet um, sought to oppose those words. Um, and then you see uh, the final judgment, at least on Jeroboam. If you go to, can someone read um, from chapter fourteen? Uh, we'll read four to eighteen. Yeah. Now Jeroboam's wife did what he said and went to um, Jacob's house in Shiloh. Oh, I should say she was sent there uh, under dis in disguise. Okay. Now Ahijah couldn't see, he could not see. His sight was gone because of his age. But the Lord told Ahijah, Jeroboam's wife is coming to ask you about her son. For he is ill, and you have to give her such and such an answer. When she arrives, she will pretend to be somebody else. So when Elijah heard the sound of her footsteps at the door, he said, Come in, wife of Jeroboam. Why this pretense? I have been sent to you with bad news. Go, tell Jeroboam that this is what the Lord says, the God of Israel says, I will raise you up from among the people and appoint you ruler over my people, Israel. I tore the kingdom away from the house of David and gave it to you. But you have not been like my servant David, who kept my commands and followed me with all of his heart, doing only what was right in my eyes. 
You have done more evil than all who did before you. You have made yourself other gods, idols made of metal. You have aroused my anger and turned your sword back on me. Because of this, I'm going to bring disaster on your house, on the house of Jeroboam. I will cut off from Jeroboam every last male in Israel, slave or free. I will burn up the house of Jeroboam as one burns down until it is all done. Dogs will eat those belonging to Jeroboam. Eat those well with Jeroboam who die in the city, and the birds will feed on those who die in the country. The Lord has spoken. As for you, go back home. When you set forth foot in your city, the boy will die. All Israel will mourn you and bury him. He is the only one belonging to Jeroboam who will be buried, because he is the only one in the house of Jeroboam in whom the Lord, the God of Israel, has found anything good. The Lord will raise up for himself a king over Israel who will cut off the family of Jeroboam. Even now, this is beginning to happen. And the Lord will strike Israel so that it will be like a reed swaying in water. He will uproot Israel from this good land that he gave to their ancestors and scatter them beyond the Euphrates River because they aroused the Lord's anger by making Asherah poles. And he will give Israel up before the sins, because of the sins of Jeroboam has committed and has caused Israel to commit. Then Jeroboam's wife got up and left and went to Tizha. As soon as she stepped over the threshold of the house, the boy died. They buried him, and all of Israel mourned for him, as the Lord had said through his servant, the prophet Elijah. All right. Interesting, isn't it, that... Um... The boy dies, um, but he's the only one that pleased, that God is pleased with. Um, and therefore, he's the only one who will be buried. Yeah, very um, strong judgment. So you start to pick up even with very early on, here's the criteria for a king uh, under God. Well, first is that he is a king under God is that uh, he's under God's rule um, and uh, and therefore like he worships Yahweh alone and he listens to Yahweh alone and he honours Yahweh alone. Um, he's also supposed to rid Israel of idolatry that wasn't completely done in the time of Joshua, judges, um, and yet Jeroboam's worship practices seem to be straight out of the DIY handbook picked up from the Canaanites, um, nothing particularly, um, you know, particularly um, Jewish about it, actually. Only by name, though, remember when the, the golden calf was um, in, in Exodus um, and almost to, the, almost to the letter, the same words are said with these calves in, um, in 1 Kings, that uh, here are your gods, O Israel. Here is your God. Um, it's not that they, they were trying to replace Yahweh, but they were trying to create a different way to Yahweh, uh, one that they controlled. That's the key. It's one that they controlled. Remember when we talked about David bringing the ark into Jerusalem and the narrator was at pains to point out he didn't control the ark. Um, it could look like that. You know, it, it could dangerously become that um, in, and it seems to be what all the Canaanite um, power centres would do is you control the religion and therefore you have more control over the people. You use these gods to ratify your political decisions and all those sorts of things and ratify your authority. And yet very clearly in what happens with David bringing the ark, he's, he has no control over this. Um, uh, in fact... It's a, he aborts the first attempt because of the disaster that's happening. Um, and, uh, and then he finds it, the house of um, whatever the name guy, guy's name was, Obed Elam or something, was being blessed. And he brings the ark in. It was a great um, amount of sacrifices and all that. Um, but it's not the ark itself that is worshipped. It's a God who dwells uh, in the presence between the cherubim on the ark. Um, and yet Jeroboam's just doing exactly what the Canaanites do. Here's the gods, 
And he's your God, and he's now all the systems that you that I need to manipulate that God to control my political um, aspirations or to roll them out and to use them to ratify himself. Um, and also he was meant to be faithful to the covenant, which means fulfilling the law of Moses, and he's gone pretty much, well, almost directly uh, against the uh, the second commandment. You should have no images, make no images of me. Um, so he's uh, he's gone off the rails pretty much. But that forms the assessment of every other king that will come after this. Um, and it seems that the narrator is fairly uninterested uh, or not terribly interested in their political or their strategic or their military successes in any way. It's really how they relate to God and how they fulfill these sorts of criteria. All right. Um, so here we go. Kings from Jeroboam through to Hoshea. Um, it's broken up into nine different dynasties, um, and uh, and you'll, you'll work out why that's important as we as we go on. Um, in the PTC notes, it uh, it makes clear what those nine different dynasties um, are. How many of them do you think are assessed as good? The video gave that away before. Zero. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, zero were judged to be good. We we get a few good one. We get a few we get a few golden ages there, um, in terms of prosperity and stuff like that, um, and military success. But none are ultimately judged to be uh, receiving the approval of God. Um, so there's a there's a quick list of them all, um, and there's a little descriptor that appears in in the text there. Um, of the sorts of ways in which they're assessed at the end of their lives or the end. So did evil, did more evil, did more evil than any of them before. <laughs> um, and uh, evil, but not like his predecessors. <laughs> Varying shades of evil, but they're all on the wrong side of the ledger. Um, but uh, the golden age approximately or roughly Omri to Jeroboam II, um, so about halfway through there, um, and you do get a, um, but you do get a, a longer period uh, of that. So about 132 years of that um, golden period between Omri and Jeroboam II, um, and only sort of 30, so 31 years um, from Jeroboam II onwards. So things go into a pretty sharp decline and a fairly unstable period where kings are just getting topped off as we saw in the video they're just getting <laughs> stabbed in the back by the next one uh in a matter of months and years it's uh, it's very short uh sorry where down the bottom oh, okay well did what we did see that um but ultimately, where did Jehu end up? He started doing what was right. What was but he ended up being uh, a fairly uh, he, he started off that whole um, he, he done some pretty uh, what was it? Um, never would turn him up and have a look. Jehu nine three. No, I mean, uh, sorry, Jehu nine three. Yeah, one, yeah, one kings. Is that one thing? Is that two things? Mm -hmm. So he's just scanning. Ah, okay. So nine three anointed by Elisha. Uh, take a flask of oil, pour it on his head and say, this is what the Lord says, I anoint you king over Israel. Open the door, escape, and don't wait. Um, and then 10.30, uh, 
nevertheless. Okay. So have a look at before that, verse 28 from chapter 10 in 2 Kings. Jehu eliminated Baal worship from Israel, but he did not turn away from the sins of Jeroboam, son of Nebat, had caused Israel to commit, worshipping the golden calves that were in Bethel and Dan. Nevertheless, the Lord said to Jehu, because you have done well in carrying out what is right in my sight and have done and have done to the house of Ahab all that was in my heart, um, four generations of your sons will sit on the throne of Israel. Hmm. I don't know. Well, did what was right in the eyes of the Lord. Yeah, did what was right in my sight. Um 31 goes on, yet Jehu was not careful to follow with all his heart the law of the Lord God of Israel. He did not turn from the sins of Jeroboam that caused Israel to commit. So there's the same, there's the same criteria though on which they're judged. Um, yeah. So almost, but not quite. Mm. Mm. All right. Um, let's switch over. But good pickup, by the way, too, Luke. Um, is the North all bad? people who were still worshipping God, the correct one, Elijah, Elijah, and they kind of hints, as I was listening to it, and they were picking up, I was just something that, mm. that there were people, you know, there were one or two, um, who seemed to be worshipping God, but not all. Mm-hmm. Yep, and you get, um, I mean, the narrator spends a fair bit of time going back to the Northern Kingdom. It's not as though he sees the Southern Kingdom as the only one. Um, and he doesn't, essentially, he doesn't ignore the Northern Kingdom. Um, it's a, it's he a, spends a whole, a whole amount yeah. of chapters just on the Northern Kingdom. Hmm. You don't hear that Southern Kingdom talk a lot. Yeah. Uh, and, the, and the other thing is, it's still um, it's still precious to God. Um, so, well, instigated, it was started through judgment on Solomon. So it had a role to play. Um, and, and so God wanted that northern kingdom there for the good, ultimate good of his people. It wasn't meant to, you know, it wasn't uh, something that invented itself out of rebellion. Um, in fact, it was in, it was instigated by God because of the southern kingdom's rebellion or the rebellion of Solomon. Um, but and yeah, we've talked about that. Assessed by their failure um, to reform um, Jeroboam's sin, but not they they weren't a failure because of the fact that they were split from the southern kingdom um, and the fact that God. Again and again, keeps sending them prophets. He, you don't send prophets to call people back to the word of the Lord, to to, to seek them to uh, trust Him again, to turn away from the sin of Jeroboam, unless uh, God cares for them and has a has a purpose and a plan for them. Um, so we did seek to call them back. There was the story of the woman. Who didn't have any food and I could Elijah. Yeah. Obviously there were people there who still It's kind of like when you read read through judges and you shake your head, but then you get to Ruth and you go, Well, actually this was during the period of the judges. There were some good people there. Yeah. Yeah. Without going too much into it, that Sarah Pat was not thinking about. So we'll cover that next week. Yeah. The, the, the verse sort of talked a little on what about how, yeah, but it's not all bad. <clears throat> Even, um, you know, there were sprinklings on, you know, God's good show, the, how, God's good show mercy, 
Um, and he was even um, merciful to a woman like that mm. um, when he repents. And that, um, you know, they say it's, it's, it's on and off, like some of, some of the reading, but it's not without the positive side. Mm. It's, it's not really to be seen as a mindless tirade against talking to women. Mm. Um, you know, they still, and they talked about how, and they talked about how um, there was the spiritual Israel that within and distinct from a political Israel. Mm. Uh, a remnant that remained faithful to Yahweh in the dark respects of the nation's apostasy. Um, so there was still that, 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 that yes. patience of God as well. Yes. Um, and if um, if we have a look at 1 Kings 19, you get a hint of that. So 1 Kings 19, 9, yeah, from 9 onwards. And uh, and so this is uh, uh, Elijah encountering the Lord um, from the cave, and uh, he's pretty upset. Um, he's saying it's all a mess. This whole thing's not going. Is 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 all going to the dogs? Um, God calls him out, um, and uh, and we get that sort of classic uh, little section where God is in the soft whisper, um, and suddenly uh, the voice comes up to him, what are you doing here, Elijah? And he's, he's complaining, I have been very zealous for the Lord, from verse 14, uh, God of hosts, he replied, but the Israelites have aban abandoned your covenant, torn down your altars and killed your prophets with the sword. I alone am left and they're looking for me to take my life. Woe well, is me. I'm the only one. It's not fair. Um, then the Lord said to him, go and return by the way you came to the wilderness of Damascus. When you arrive, you are to anoint Hazel king over Aram. You are to anoint Jehu, son of Nimshi, as king over Israel. And, uh, and a couple others there. I'm just scanning down. Yeah, Jehu is the one who's going to be commissioned to put to death, as we saw before, those who, um, of Ahab's family. Verse 18, but I will leave 7,000 in Israel, every knee that has not bowed to Baal and every mouth that has not kissed him. Um, and so there is, um, in the very next verse, is a continuation of Elijah's prophetic ministry. Um, but in verse 18, a clear indication that there is a small remnant. Now, where does that remnant end up? I don't know. Um, it certainly doesn't end. It, certainly, Israel as a as a northern kingdom, as a, a national identity or a subnational identity or even a tribal identity, disappears in the Assyrian um, exile. But as it as it is always, and as we've sort of emphasised before. There is a simple explanation of what happened to Israel. So they didn't repent from the sin of Jeroboam um, and they were sent in exile. But we always, as we keep saying, life is a bit more complex than that. And uh, there are complexities and nuances and differences. And here we discover not all Israel was committed to Baal worship. Not all Israel had forgotten the Lord. So the book's still open a little bit on that. Question. When Elijah was told to go and um, anoint Hezia, he heard that coming. I think Aram is Aram is is what yeah, Aram is Assyria, I think. And so they're the ones that are going to deal the decisive blow to um, to the Northern Kingdom. Yeah. So even even Assyria aren't completely, you know, acting on their own, or at least whether they know it or not themselves. All right. We'll keep going. Unless there's any other questions or comments, feel free to stop me. Um, 20 Kings, 
in the southern kingdom as, as well. I think I they said 20 kings in the video, and I'm not sure if they were rounding up. I could only count 19, maybe if I miscounted. 20 kings from Rehoboam to Zedekiah. And the difference this time, one dynasty. So a lot more, lot more stability uh, out of that when you think of the stability that, that all the, the uh, instability that happens when a, um, a dynasty is changed. Someone usually has to be stabbed. Um, in, uh, in this case, uh, a lot more stable. Um, and eight judged to be good and 12 judged to be evil. So there's the other list compiled uh, of the southern kingdom. Uh, there is a notable exception in there. Do you notice? Do you see the notable exception? Yeah. Atalia. Um, and there's a bit of a story behind her. Um, the impression we can get, though, when we read the read one or two kings, is that Judah and Judah in the southern kingdom are on par with the northern kingdom. Um, the Judah are quite relatively small, sparse, um, politically somewhat insignificant. Um, and yet that's where the promise remains, uh, or the covenant remains. And they will eventually be taken out by uh, Babylon in those two waves that we saw. Um, there is some research on this to do at home, but to, to have a look again at what the uh, assessment is of each king um, and the formula that it follows. Um, and uh, and, uh, and ask, um, I guess, you know, why each, why each assessment is given. And what would we see as important what does our world see as important that God doesn't seem to look at too much and see as important? All right, we'll come back to Atalia uh, later on. She's uh, not what you'd call a Swede. Uh, so Rehoboam, so he is the uh, son of Solomon. Um, so we're going back to the same time as Jeroboam, just to make it confusing. Jeroboam and Rehoboam. Uh, although I noticed in the video they said Rehoboam or something like that. They probably know a bit more Hebrew than I do. Um, let's read this section and see what you think of him. So Rehoboam, son of Solomon, was king in Judah. He was 41 years old when he became king and he reigned 17 years in Jerusalem, the city the Lord had chosen out of all the tribes of Israel in which to put his name. His mother's name was Neymar, and, uh, and she was an Ammonite. There's a little reminder what uh, Solomon was up to. Um, and Judah did, evil, Judah did evil in the eyes of the Lord. By the sins they committed, they stirred up his jealous anger more than their fathers had done. They also set up for themselves high places, sacred stones and Asherah poles on every high hill and under every spreading tree. There were even male shrine prostitutes in the land and the people engaged in all the detestable practices of the nations the Lord had driven out before the Israelites. What do you reckon is the start of the southern king? Um, do you recall, did, you might have read uh, Rehoboam was advised by his father's advisors uh, in um, in. Uh, earlier on in chapter 12, to, hey, your father was a bit tough on people. Uh, he went a bit too far in some areas. How about you, you know, start your reign with a little bit of uh, a softer hand and Rehoboam doesn't listen to them. Instead, he listens to the buddies he grew up with and they say, no, let's, uh, you, you, need to, you need to stamp your authority down. You need to be even tougher than your dad and he listens to them. Uh, and it all turns to a disaster right in front of them. Um, so a good lesson there for young leaders, <laughs> perhaps. Um, 
And uh, and the writer of 1 Kings doesn't really find anything to praise about Rehoboam. Um, so you get an idea of how things are going to go. Uh, you don't get too much hope at the beginning. Um, in fact, he he increases uh, he increasingly increasingly adopts the pagan worship practices around him. Have a look at chapter fourteen, uh, from verse twenty one. Oh no, that's the one we do have. Sorry, I'm the same reference. Yeah. Um, so yeah, male shrine prostitutes, all the di all the different uh, places that they were told not to have. Uh, all reflecting almost identity, Canaanite worship uh, in Israel. Uh, let's go to um, one of the other kings, Asa. Asa, I'm not sure how to say it. Um, he's an example of someone who's fairly zealous in 1 Kings 15, verse 13. He deposed his grandma, deposed his grandmother, Marka, from her position as queen mother because she had made a repulsive asterisk. Asherah pole, they should cut the pole down and burn it in the Kidron Valley. So he goes on a bit of a campaign of reform. He gets rid of the, the prostitutes. He gets rid of his grandmother, or at least demotes her. Um, that's a pretty gutsy move to get rid of Nana. No more cookies. Um, but he didn't quite go all the way. He didn't remove, he didn't get around to removing all the shrines. Um, he uh, he he's pretty he's successful in defending um, from attacks from outside, um, and uh, he does what um, a lot of kings do. Um, he has to do some political maneuvering to protect his kingdom, um, and in a desperate moment, he he strips all the I guess the remaining treasures out of the temple uh, and uses them to persuade Syria um, to back off from Israel um, um, oh, sorry to, to back off from Judah and to attack Israel um, and uh, and they open up another front so again a mixed a bit of a mixed bag for Asia right intentions um, but Obviously, when you've got to demote your own grandmother, you know that the situation is not good. You're up against it. Um, so even the good kings are going to have a hard time. Um, here's another, another, another one who's a bit of a mixed bag, Jehoshaphat, a good king and a bad matchmaker. Uh, so let me read 2 Kings 8, 16. In the... Fifth year of Joram, son of Ahab, the king of Israel, when Jehoshaphat was king of Judah, so while he's king, Jehoram, son of Jehoshaphat, began his reign as king of Judah. He was 32 years old when he became king, and he reigned in Jerusalem eight years. He walked in the ways of the kings of Israel, as the house of Ahab had done, for he married a daughter of Ahab. He did evil in the eyes of the Lord. <clears throat> So he starts reigning while his father is king. Uh, and that daughter of Ahab is Athalia. So uh, I don't think I pasted this in, did I? Should have pasted it in. Uh, Athalia um, is the granddaughter of uh, Omri. Um, uh, her marriage with uh, 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 Joram, 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 king of Judah, marked her marked an alliance between north and south and implied the superiority of Israel. The death of her son Ahaziah after the reign of one year at the hand of Jehu uh, in the prophetic revolution revealed her as that wicked woman, and to retain power that uh, she enjoyed as queen mother, she destroyed the royal family uh, and began, and she began to reign. Uh, for six years, her authority was unchallenged. Then the priest Jehoiada put the child Joash on the throne. Um, she, became, she came out to meet her enemies and was put to death outside the temple. So for a period there, 
uh, the southern kingdom gets handed over to a Canaanite queen. Oh, sorry, an Israelite queen. Yeah, an Israelite queen, but a queen that, sorry, a Canaanite worshipping queen. Um, and so the, um, the, the PTC notes, uh, I guess, give a bit of a pastoral position here to say, Jehoshaphat's experience should warn us that those who are charged with leading God's people must never enter into partnerships with those who have abandoned the fundamentals of faith, no matter how statesmanlike or magnanimous such a move may appear to be, um, which is a warning that we pick up in, in Titus and, and Galatians in the New Testament. So Jehoshaphat was one of those kings that was, um, he did other good things. He, you know, he... He tries to reconnect with the Northern Kingdom. He tries to um, even influence the Northern Kingdom for good. Um, but uh, And he helps them against Syria. But, um, yeah, let's, uh, let's things go badly um, in terms of matchmaking for his son. All right. So the Southern Kingdom, Jehoash. Or Joash depends on the the uh, translation you have. I noticed that Jehoash through to Ahaz. Um, Jehoash, he he's someone who gives and takes away. This is something about the temple in this period. Is it really ends up becoming this kind of weird repository of wealth um, or a bank where you you build up uh, wealth in the temple and then you strip it out again later to pay off some king. Um, it's your, it's like your piggy bank. And uh, it, that's the kind of the way it operates. Um, so Joash um, himself restores the, the temple in, uh, in chapter 12, um, only from halfway through the chapter to plunder it again. So it details how the, the temple was built up. And then from verse 17 in chapter 2 Kings 12, about this time, Hazel, king of Aram, went up and attacked Gath and captured it. Then he turned to attack Jerusalem. Um, but Joash, king of Judah, took all the sacred objects dedicated to his fathers, dedicated by his fathers, Jehoshaphat, Joram, and Ahaziah, the kings of Judah, and the gifts he himself had dedicated, and all the gold found in the treasuries of the temple of the Lord and of the royal palace, and he sent them to Hazel, king of Aram, who then withdrew from Jerusalem. Um, so there is a period of stability um, during this time as well, um, Jehoash through to Ahaz. Um, but uh, you can see that it's not all good either. There's, there's uh, difficulty in being um, in the southern kingdom, even though you're trying, you're kind of out of the picture of what's happening in the north. Um, yeah. All right. Um, David will spend more time on this next week, the Northern Kingdom, Elisha. Uh, no, I should say Elijah and Elisha, not Elisha and Elisha. Amos, Jonah, Hosea, uh, and the Southern Kingdom prophets, Isaiah, Micah, Jeremiah, Obadiah. Um, uh, they're all there. They're going to um, speak on God's behalf, be covenant watchdogs, um, and, uh, and speak against what's happening in the land uh, with idolatry and injustice and keep pointing people back to the law. Um, watchman is the term often used, messenger, man of God, uh, for these, these um, prophets. But I prefer this one, uh, the alarm clock. And uh, I'm going to take us back to Sunday school. Uh, yeah. Um, we'll put that video in the link, but uh, yeah, <laughs> I, I always found that it out. Uh, I felt, when I first heard that, I thought it's actually a very brilliant illustration of what a uh, what a prophet is meant to do in the Old Testament is to say, Wake up! Um, yeah, all right, uh, so a fairly short one today. Um, we didn't, uh, we didn't. To need to go to, through too many exercises, but has anyone had any other questions or comments or thoughts about where they were 
what's going on in this period? I was just struck by the, the bit about Joash that reminds me of the that if I could start with 2 Kings 12, what do you reckon the distinction is here? So verse 2, he did what was right in the eyes of the Lord all his days. And then in verse 3, the shrines, however, were allowed to remain free to continue to set until the last day. So is there like a distinction there between his sort of like personal rightness before God, but his failure as a king? Is that the distinction that's being, being drawn there? Yeah, I think so. But also, I think in the background is is that complexity that you, the the king doesn't have complete control. Um, that's something that takes generations to build up. There's a cultural problem in the background. There's only so much that they are able to achieve, and you, it, it helps, I think, answer the question as well as when you when you look at um, the fact that these prophets were sent to speak to the kings often. And, you, and then the kings do these terrible things and, you know, this is all we have. We have these lists of what's happening with the kings. And you think, you know, is that fair that the whole northern kingdom gets taken off into exile? You know, every day mums and dads and children and families, and they cop it. But you also get little hints along the way that, well, actually they were part of this as well. They were part of the sins of Israel. They, they certainly had... In the Northern Kingdom, a long list of bad leaders. Um, but we saw before there were 7,000 who hadn't bowed the knee to Baal or hadn't, you know, hadn't worshipped him. Um, and, uh, and yet here, even with good leadership from the top, there are still those who persist in worshipping those. So I don't know how to, whether to take it uh, too much of a uh, how much how much we take it as a, as a personal um, criticism of him as a king, or whether we take it as a just a, a, a reality of the the day. There's only so much that he was able to do. Is that how? You know, there's people wanting someone to notice um, how the audience is being, um, what, 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 what they're really interested in, how faithful are they faithful to this king was. They may have been really, really successful, but that one guy, Rosario, I think, was, um, who was arguably the most successful, um, his reign was passed over in just four verses. Mm -hmm. um, so, so the criteria is um, um, that, that um, how Good, good or bad leader, they are, they are God speaking, and that um, I tell you, it, it remains the one thing that really matters today. Success is, success is a fickle thing, it depends on our varying capacities and in particular circumstances in which we place. Yeah, some will be more successful than others, but the one thing that will finally count is not whether we have been successful, but whether we have been faithful. Yeah, and then when we get to um, something out of the community, which I haven't read yet, but one of the things we'll choose, um, there's something there about that as well. Um, yeah, this was probably stood out to me um, as important, so I was trying to get the context. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, I had a conversation with a, um, someone who's pretty close to me uh, just recently who's gone through a divorce and, uh, and um, they, I don't know how they did it, but um, probably somewhat foolishly stumbled across a photo of their former wife with a with the person who effectively the third person who got in and and, and uh, was a catalyst for breaking up the marriage um, and uh, and it hit him hard you know they've been it's been seven years since that happened but um, he said it still hits him very hard uh, and uh, I remember counseling him, closely through that time and encouraging him at a time when, when this was all coming apart that actually this is the time to you know you need to fight for your family you need to fight for your wife you need to fight for your marriage you need to fight for your children um, uh, but I also said to him at the time and this is something he distinctly remembers is that you need to also prepare yourself that you may not win this fight um, you may not win your family back and and from what I've seen with different situations like that, when a third person gets involved, it is very difficult. 
it's very unlikely. Um, and I didn't want to sell him a false hope either. Um, but I did say to him when he, when, you know, when he reflected on that, um, that success in terms of saving your marriage, keeping your family together, that really wasn't what it was about. The fight is about to stay faithful um, and to seek faithfulness, um, to seek to honour the Lord no matter how much is thrown at you, no matter what is going on around you. Seek to honour the Lord. And um, and I, I said to him, you know, I can be proud of you, mate, you did that. Now, the, the victory wasn't what perhaps you wanted it to be, but victory belongs to the Lord and he will do his work. Um, and your role and your continued role, because you're still a father, um, you may end up being a husband again, um, is to stay faithful um, and to not let go of the God who hasn't let him go. Um, and that, that's sort of the same sort of reflection like some of these kings were faithful as we just reflected on, on that one but perhaps on Joash but you know couldn't quite get the result that he wanted um, Adam, was it a women's conference yesterday and that came up that Sometimes the things we pray for, which we think are mm. oh, righteous prayers, like saving a, a sick child, mm. when that doesn't happen, um, we can do, yep, we can grieve, we can get angry with God, but don't, don't, um, when she is, don't turn that into a bitterness of the God. The struggles we go through is because we're in a simple world, and some mm. of the things we pray for, which are righteous prayers, don't get answered because we're in a simple world. But you just have to be careful that it doesn't make us bitter towards God. Mm. I've had to read a little bit this morning, um, to um, some podcasts about the series called Leave a Change on the Table, i.e., when you find Jesus and you um, find faith. You're given something, but it's quite easy to, as your journey goes on, lose that, lose that faith. He really has stuff from what he's thrown at him. So his God tells a story about all the bad things that have happened to him in that particular season. You know, like, so I'm talking about you know, like, you know, his friends, you know, his family. Hmm. It's quite easy then to, 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 to blame God. You know, man, why have you done this? Yeah. Right. Oh, yeah. Right. What do you answer? Why? Yeah. And I think what what I've really learned through all that through my own experience and through all the things we're not talking about this is that it's it's beside the point. You know, like it's you call the prayer. You know, sometimes very good, but but it's more about what God has got planned and we have to have fundamental you know remain faithful. Hmm. Even the strength to get through the um, no matter what they are. Hmm. Is this this speaker actually runs retreats for Christian parents who've lost a lost a child by now? And hmm. that was that part of the teaching that she tried to get through to them. Yeah, you know, grieve, get angry, hmm. take your anger to God, but don't make it change into business again. Hmm. Yeah. I mean, Manasseh, King Manasseh is a case in point. Um, terribly evil things that he did. Uh, so 2 Kings 21, you, you read about uh, Manasseh, um, all the altars that he built, all the things that he did, um, the great um, evil, um, sacrificing uh, children, um you know, worshipping all sorts of things in the temple. Um, and yet I think uh, it's Manessa who um, repents near the end of his life. Um, and yet God is still going to punish the sin of Manessa. Um, then you get um, Josiah, the young, the young King Josiah, son of Manessa. 
yeah, um, does much good, restores the word of the Lord to the like, rediscovers the probably the the um, the Torah, the the, the law, um, reinstitutes the feasts and Passovers and things like that, um, and yet it's not quite enough. It's not as though as if you, or you get the impression, oh, maybe just I didn't do enough. It's not that. It's that God had already decided and the plan was already there. What Josiah did was to be faithful. Um, what God was doing was something bigger and different um, and more. And that can be really hard to accept um, and really hard to see, particularly when you're in it. Um, but nonetheless, um, it, uh, it's, what, it's what we see in the scriptures and the way, you know, God is, the way God is working. Um, and so, yeah, we don't quite get the outcomes that we expect all the time. And that's part of that. That's what I mean, that, that complexity that's flowing through these chapters that we can easily gloss over. Hmm. All right. We'll... Um, Pick it up again next week. Um, read the notes and uh, and try and scan through or read as much as you can of um, of this section. I found that's really the only way to get your head around it. I, I remember studying for this in first year of Bible college, and um, in the end, I, I put down the the notes that I was had it more college, I just read. I just read for hours and hours the stories and sort of got into that. Not that I hadn't read it before. I had, I, I, you know, done lots of dip, dipped in, but I just needed to sit in it for a, and get my get into the, the narrative and get into the shape of it. Um, and uh, it does draw you in. But one of the things I used to like to do is, is read it with a Bible dictionary nearby because some of the names just get a brief mention and you you kind of lose track of, hang on, who was that? Um, and with Bible Dictionary, you can flick open and not only have a paragraph or two, but it just orientates you to go, oh, right, that person. He was going about the coming and out. Mm. Yeah. Yeah. Mm. yeah. Yeah, and some, yeah. Of those, and some of those links aren't immediately clear in the text. Yeah. Um, they might have been for a first reader of the text. Um, we need a little bit of uh, extra help with something like a Bible dictionary. I found it really helpful because I found as I sat down to read it, my mind was confused. So I've been going on my walks into it. That's the right word. Yeah. Okay. I'm trying to wait for it. Yeah. Um, and that's kind of what yeah. Yeah. Excellent. Excellent. Okay. How about I pray for us? Father God, thanks. So much for being able to dip again into your word. Um, and we do um, acknowledge the complexity of, of life um, under the sun in this world, of life uh, in a world that has been uh, broken and tainted by sin. Um, and yet we're also recipients of your great promises through Jesus. Uh, life is up and down and, um, and sometimes back to front. Uh, and yet... Um, it's also quite simple in, in that you've called us to be faithful to your son, Jesus, and faithful to your word and to uh, to trust your work and mission in this world. And um, although things do not go as we plan and things seem to be often um, spiralling out of control, uh, we know that you are the God who has always had a plan, always had a purpose to everything that happens, uh, and we have the privilege to be part of that. But um, help us to trust you in this topsy-turvy world Help us to remember that uh, you that you do um, uh, show us in your word um, that uh, that you what you are heading towards um, in this uh, in your plan in, to the new creation to the vindication of your name the glorification of your Son Jesus and with it with Him the glorification of your people. Amen. Amen. All right. Thanks, everyone.